Welcome, highfalutin. Actually, no, we're just calling it the Ski Bum Podcast now. That's right. Ski Bum Podcast episode number 288. It is your pals, Mario and Brian. Mario, what's up? Not much. It's been a while since we, we uh, did a podcast. I hear everybody talking about watching this podcast, you know, listening to this podcast. I'm like, what about ours, man? Yeah, there was, you know, there was a big hurricane last week. And Mario, you were right. You were almost... In Almost the in the center. It. Yeah. I think like Monday or so, it was looking like it was coming right your way. But luckily, she went, whoop, made went a turn further south, had a rainy day. That was about it. Everything's cool. You're safe. You're happy. Everything's wonderful. All so cool. That's a good thing. It's October, baby. You know, we're getting back on schedule now. Uh, we had an awesome interview this week with our new pal, Charles McNall. He is a founder of a brand new ski rack called the Chuck Bucket. So nice. More on that in our main topic. And a big thank you for checking us out and check us out at skibumpodcast.com. Like I mentioned, I think for now we will be dropping the highfalutin part of the ski bum podcast. I think we're just going to be called the ski bum podcast. We're stripping it down. We're trying to figure out marketing. I don't know. Like we're trying to make this more marketable. I don't know. Are we less? I think we're less highfalutin now with inflation. And I know I got a family and they're, taking all my money all the time so That's right there's not a lot of high fluting going on lately no we're keeping it way more ski bum now not like fancy was, trips just bumming it when we started the podcast it was like a 60 40 like high to ski bum yeah it's like 90 ski bum now like there's not a lot of high anymore like i used to buy fancy whiskeys and fancy beers oh yeah dude i'm out of bourbon in my house i'm slumming it these days do you like, freaking I believe to, it i got no I, bourbon i got whiskey but i'm i not a big whiskey fan. Get some uh, like Virginia gentleman, like some real like ghetto plastic handle stuff. <laughs> Dude, I got this. It's called um, Hellcat Hellcat Mary whiskey. That's what I got. Hellcat Mary. Is it in a plastic jug? It is not in a plastic jug. I got it as a uh, kind of as a goof gift. My brother gave it to me, but I'm like, that's what I'm drinking these days because I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm like, I got to I got to drink it. I'm not buying more inflation, man. Real. Inflation, yeah. Yo. So yes, that's that's part of the reason. But also, too, we have the URL. We have all the uh, social medias at Ski Bump Podcast. So we decided. That's let's our just, official name, let's LLC. Just, we have an actual LLC that's called that. So we've like yeah. that's our our term, like our name. So you know what? We're from now on, at least for the time being, we are just the Ski Bump Podcast. We're keeping okay. it easy. We're stripping it down. Same logo, same everything. But it's just we're going with that, so get used to it, because that's the yeah. way it's going to be, at least for now. Hey, we still have the highfalutin dream. Like we're trying to get to that level, but we have highfalutin dreams, that's for sure. Highfalutin dreams. We got the Robin Leach dreams. Half, that's so. right. Champagne, champagne, champagne dreams, wishes and caviar dreams. Champagne Maybe powder just... and uh, steak and caviar dreams. I don't know. We're so ghetto we can't even come up with it. That's how ghetto we are. Damn. Ski Bum. Beautiful. Check us out. The socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, untapped at Ski Bum Podcast. Send us an email, Ski Bum Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube. I think that's all we're on for now. Uh, go to your favorite podcasting apps, rate and subscribe. Big news. We did mention it in the last podcast, but now it's actually official, official, sort of official. It's, it's pretty a- much like 90% official. Papers have been signed. Papers Agreements- have been signed have been made virtual handshakes were were exchanged snowbound expo boston november 18th to 20th your pals will be there yes so if you're not familiar the crowd is excited it used to be called the boston ski and snowboard expo uh bernie weisel i think it's weisel was his last name he sold this show in like December of 2019, like the most perfect timing to sell an in like person business ever. Just pre COVID. Just so pre COVID. Yeah. So he sold it to, I think it was SIA and they kind of changed it, rebranded it, Snowbound Expo. 2020 didn't happen. 2021 was supposed to happen, got canceled at the last minute. 2022, yeah. back, back in the game, Heinz Convention Center, Boston, Massachusetts, again, November 18th. Through twentieth, we will be there. Not only not just visiting, 
not just being there, We're wandering part of the show. around like a bunch of oafs. We will be hosting the Snow Skills Cabin. Yeah. We still don't know exactly what that entails. It entails snow skills and us. That's all you got to know. Well, we don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure because there's an inspiration stage and then there's the snow skills cabin. I think the snow skills cabin is kind of the fun place to be while the inspiration stage is a little more like seriousy. There are some pretty epic guests who will be there. Bodie Miller, our pal Dan Egan, oh. Danny Reyes Acosta, Chris Davenport, Conrad Anchor, Philip Henderson. So there's some legit people who are going to be here and us, of course, which is I'm thinking hilarious. we're going to have a chance for some skills talk with them. That's what I'm hoping. Yes, for sure. And there is an indoor hill, like a little indoor slope. I mean, it's tiny. It's probably, I don't know, 30 feet, maybe a vert, but vert. I don't know what they're going to do there. It must be one of the, the plastic ones like they have over in the UK. They're going to have balance boards. They're going to have a bunch of like fun stuff to do. So, yeah. This is going to be super cool. We're going to be there. I can't wait to see all of our old friends who we haven't seen in years because of all this, you know, COVID crap. Make new friends. We're going to be part of this show. Like, I can't even wrap my head around that we're going to be part of it. They invited us to do this. So we're going to be super psyched to be there. Check out snowboundexpo.com for more info. If this, if you've been listening to this before September 30th, you could have gotten free tickets using the code Ski Bum. But I think all the free tickets are gone. So we popped it up on our Instagram too. We were promoting it. It was on Instagram. The last episode, I did cut in the information. So hopefully you checked out the last episode because then you could have gotten some free tickets. But we're going to be there and we're super excited. And hopefully we'll see you there. If you're going to be there, hit us up on any of the socials and let us know. Because we're going to be you know, posting some some stuff, our, our adventures going on. Because we have a media day on the Thursday. Then the, the actual show starts on Friday. It's like the half day Friday. Then Saturday, Sunday. So we're going to be going to a bunch of events. Hanging out with a bunch of cool people, talking a lot of skiing. One person who we won't be there, but who is a new friend of ours, as we mentioned earlier, not only is Charles and the Chuck Bucket our main topic, they are also a new sponsor of the yeah, podcast. Welcome. Welcome, Chuck. Welcome, Chuck Bucket. <clears throat> this episode brought to you by the Chuck Bucket, a brand new ski rack from a startup out of Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a trailer hitch rack that's designed to hold eight pairs of skis or four plus snowboards. Nice. It's simple to load for the whole family and easy for anyone to install and uninstall from the hitch. So go check it out at chuckbucket.com. Awesome. Not only that, another cool thing about this, if you like to shred in the off season, they also have a bike rack that works with it's uh, like the, the system is modular. So the actual uh, like center support piece that can be kind of modified to add the bike rack to it. So yeah. you've already got the core system, you take off the bucket, you add the bike rack, boom, you keep this rack on all year. There's a lot yeah, you can do with it. Bike rack is pretty cool looking. It has the bikes kind of up straight reversed on the back of your car. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's pretty unique. I talked to Charles in the main topic again. If you want to get the full details about this, I mean, we went, we went pretty nerdy on on racks and on hitches, on mounts, on nice. ski gear. Like we we went pretty in depth, and I think you'll get a lot of good information on there. Again, check them out, ChuckBucket.com. Thank you, Chuck Bucket. Mario, let's kick it off the way we always do. It's time for our prey today. Well, my opera today is not much to talk about. It's uh, just water. I'm, I'm trying to water Two it out. Two weeks today. in a row, filtered water. I got to work tomorrow, and work has been rough. I went to the Bucks game last night. Not a Bucks fan, Jets fan, and they won this week, so I'm happy about that. Patrick um, Mahomes, baby. J -E Texas Tech, wreck them. Patrick just Can't stop Patrick Mahomes. Ate up TV 12 last night. Oh. Um, I think it was just the defense didn't come through. I mean, Bucks put a lot of points on the board, but I was there late, yelling, drinking, a whole lot of stuff was going on. So, <laughs> so basically, and, you had all your app right today, yesterday. Oh God, it was like we had we had like lamb lamb chops like on the grill. Like that's how we we're that was high flutin uh, 
tailgate. That is highfalutin tailgating, yeah. Yeah. So we had that. And oh, did you see the video with... a few weeks ago of in Miami when someone, I guess, must have sucked their grill in their car or under it and the car exploded? Oh, we were joking about that because our buddy brings he uh, just a charcoal grill. So he's like, yeah, I'm not setting this by my car. I'm setting it by somebody else's car. Dude, if you haven't seen this, there's actually videos of the game. So they're showing like the Dolphins game. They're just <laughs> kind of zooming out and showing the crowd. And you can see black smoke kind of outside the stadium. Oh. And it's because like what was it, like five or six cars blew up because someone oh. left a grill underneath the car and it exploded. And it got the other next couple of cars next to it. Uh, yeah, Awful. I'm looking at the uh, YouTube right now. It's pretty hilarious yeah it's bad news so luckily that didn't happen to you guys like my bad my bad yeah. man it's, oh, it's freaking awesome there's like oh they said 11 vehicles oh, it was 11 <laughs> yeah. what a dildo oh <laughs> they put a left a barbecue pit under their car it's freaking <laughs> this is why we got to teach science in high school kids Oh man, why would you leave it under the car too? Well, no, now I we once had a hibachi stolen at Giant Stadium, old Giant Stadium. Yeah, because again, it was well, this was during the XFL, so we probably deserved it. Yeah, we were grilling there, and someone just rolled on by and stole the grill. So, hey, my cool buddy, let's steal it. The next week was like, I'm gonna shove this under the car. And of course, we're all like 22. We're like, that's probably a good idea. No one's gonna steal it if it's underneath there. You put Not a chain thinking... on it and put a lock on it and and just lock it to your car, but not under it. Is this really what we've come to? We have to it lock is. up our grills. Exactly. It's like when I was living in Hoboken, you saw like baby strollers had to be locked up. Like you're really stealing baby strollers. Yep. They're like those are Garbage expensive people. baby strollers. Garbage people. So <laughs> What are you gonna oh, do? That's funny shit. So you got. Hey, I'm water. looking at the snow skills cabin that we're gonna be at. They're saying the likes of Dan Egan, Bodie Miller, and Danny uh, Razor Costa, plus others, will share their advice and training tips to help advance skill sets. So that Boom. could be us hosting. And we'll of course, hosting. of course, we will not hold back with our little brand of smarmy, sarcastic humor. Oh uh, no! They hired smarmy, sarcastic humor, and they're gonna get that smarmy, sarcastic humor. This is the way I'm looking at it. We could bomb. This and then we if, we, if we do start bombing, we're going to go down in flames. Like we're going to just, and we're taking out <laughs> hospitals, nursery schools with us. Like we're going down. Like we're going to go down hard. But if that grill is bad. We're going to be, if that grill is bad. <laughs> I'm breaking out the big size beers. <laughs> Breaking news at the Heinz Convention Center. <laughs> <laughs> what started out as a peaceful happy ski festival right. turned violent ended up with two guys trying to cut everybody with skis <laughs> what the fuck are you guys apparently doing? they're calling themselves the sons of the new revolution <laughs> <laughs> oh boy hopefully it'll be just a fun time but again well, we if the mini see. bar is stocked it might be going down forget say. the mini bar the maxi bar the maxi bar maxi bar oh we got Everybody does delivery now. We could we could get alcohol delivered. It's true. <clears throat> Hopefully, Long Trail will be there again, like they usually are. Oh, we shall see. And speaking of Long Trail, I don't know what I've become. I really don't. My upgrade today's have just gotten bizarre and weird, and this is no different. I'm just trying to expand my horizon. I, again, like you, you got water. I'm trying to find yeah. things that are either super low alcohol or non-alcohol that I can actually drink. Ah, uh, this was a weird one. Like, I don't know who thinks this is a good idea, but I saw it and I decided to buy it. So I guess I'm that target demographic. I have long trail blueberry melon CBD seltzer. Nice. That's awesome. In theory, CBD seltzer. I don't know where the blueberry or the melon flavor is. I just get plant. Like I'm just like I'm CBD. Just like I'm chewing on a stalk of hemp non-high hemp marrow you know cousin of uh of the marijuana and it's funny because the sign now this was purchased at a liquor store but it has no alcohol and no thc in it yeah it's just hemp, uh cbd it says drink and chill gluten-free and this is funny it says no thc sorry doesn't get you high man <laughs> uh, <laughs> and zero calories zilch yeah. nada 
enjoy. So it's a non-alcoholic CBD seltzer. It's got, I think, 20... 20 milligrams? 20, yeah, 20 milligrams of CBD. Nice. It's a can. So it's I got tell a you weird what, taste. You know, I'm it's taking... got that weird, again, like hempy kind of taste to it. Nice. Like you're eating someone's like hippie bag or sweater or something. <laughs> I got 25 grams uh, pills at the uh, dispensary, and they are good because they just take the edge off. If you get really good CBD, really, really works out pretty good. Yeah, it's not. Again, it's that weird kind of hempy flavor to it. It's not awful. It's not awesome. <laughs> I will say I did have one of these with vodka. It was a lot better. Ah, uh, but not there, today. Today, keep there it is chill. a um an adder. It's like a almost like you know those water uh flavor flavor spritzer things that they have in the stores those now. Little drops you kind of put in. Yeah, so I got one with THC in it, and it's supposed to be like nano, you know, nanoparticle THC to hit you faster or whatever microdosing. So, um. But you're supposed to use it like with water. You could put in a mixed drink. Now, I definitely think this has to be in like a cocktail with alcohol. And then you put this little bit of this in there. But I had it with just water and it tasted like crap. It tasted just like. Yeah, it's a weird flavor. Ah, uh, like CBD and like artificial flavor. It was just, it was horrible. It was THC you, in it too. But Aren't you ever tempted to just like put that in the water cooler at work? You know, that would be, uh, that is a good idea. Right. Like, say you got a big meeting coming up, and like, you know, like the CEO is going to get some water before the meeting. You just like dose oh. that water cooler. How you like it now? Yeah. How's this presentation? Are my <laughs> ideas so enlightening? So <laughs> inspiring. Let's get everybody high. Yeah. Not tell them. You could I think do that. Worse. might be for the Christmas party. There, there you go. go. Spike Boom. in the punch bowl. Spike in the punch. Old school. <laughs> All right. So, what's up, the old app right today? Let's go to Ski News. So starting off with a very sad story. Uh, famed U.S. ski climber Hillary Nelson was found dead after fall from Nepal Mountain. And this happened earlier last week. Uh, she was discovered last Wednesday, two days after she fell off the world's eighth highest mountain near its peak. Hillary, 49, had been skiing down from the summit of Mount Manaslu with her partner Jim Morrison, also a celebrated extreme skier, when she fell off the Himalayan mountain on Monday. Damn. Bad weather had hampered rescue efforts, but teams were able to renew their search Tuesday. Her body was found and retrieved Wednesday, said a spokesperson for Shangri-La Nepal Trek, the, organiz uh, the company that organized the expedition. Spokesperson said Nelson's body would be transported to Kathmandu, Nepal's capital. Tour company Elite Exped and Mountaineer Nims Persia, its co-founder, said on Instagram that the company's team had recovered her body and they said she would soon be on her way home. Um, Morrison had a pretty uh, like heartbreaking post to about, you know, uh, you know, about Hillary and, and the process and going on the search. There are no words to describe the love for this woman, my life partner, my lover, my best friend, and my mountain partner. She has been the beacon of light in my life day in and day out. On September 26th at 10.42 a.m., we reached the true summit of Manaslu in tough conditions. We quickly transitioned from climbing to skiing in cold and wind with a plan to ski around the corner and regroup with our Sherpa team. I skied first, and after a few turns, Hillary followed and started a small avalanche. She was swept off her feet and carried down a narrow snow slope down the south side, opposite from the climbing route, over 5,000 feet. I did everything I could to locate her, but was unable to go down the face as I hoped to find her alive and live my life with her. I spent the last two days searching from air in a helicopter. Today, with the help of Captain Surendra, an incredible skilled pilot, we were able to land at 22,000 feet and search for her. Uh, Nimsdai was instrumental in helping organize the best team and resources possible, and I found her body with the aid of Mountain Sherpa today at 1030. That's horrible. I mean, it's just... Like, oh. how do you even, like, like... Like, you can't even imagine what that experience must have been like. 
Mm. And it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. You never think it's going to go that way. Of course. I mean, they've, they've, you know, climbed and done tours together for years and it's, it's, yeah, you never think that's going to be the day. Mm. And there was a, you know, follow-up recently, um, where they had a traditional Himalayan funeral for her. I guess it was today. Oh, again, like, you know, like, what do you say? You know, like it's, it's, it's just awful. Um, you you gotta think about her family, her friends, like you you don't expect that ever, you know, how professional, how skilled the people they go with, that's not supposed to happen. And, Mm. you know, to have it happen is it's, it's heartbreaking and it's sad. And it also, you know, should all give us a little moment of, of, of thoughtfulness about how precious this life is and how you do need to enjoy every day. And it's so cliche and it's so cheesy until something like this happens. And that's when you say to yourself, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? What are we doing with our lives? Why are we, Yeah. why are we wasting time being miserable? There is no time sitting in an office, just dying a little bit every day. Why? Yeah. Mm. So, you know, rest in peace, Hillary, just thoughts out to the family and you know let's uh mm. let's just use her her light her experience her joy her inspiration to to fuel our lives and our joy and inspiration yeah it's all we Man. can do who sobering news and that's every every season we get some of that you know absolutely yep yeah. All right, moving on to the winter for, uh, winter forecast. Uh, this is probably one of the earlier ones, but uh, AccuWeather is trying to predict the winter, upcoming winter, and they're saying it could be pretty interesting, a lot different than last winter, partly due to a volcano that erupted on the other side of the globe. And that, of course, they're talking about um, the volcano was Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai, Hop High Volcano, um, which erupted on January 15, 2020. And it was an underwater volcano located about 2,200 miles northeast of Sydney. It erupted in grand fashion, sending a significant plume of gas, ash, and water vapor higher into the Earth's atmosphere. So they're saying events like these inject a huge amount of moisture into the um, into the atmosphere. And that could have an effect on the uh the water injected into stratosphere they said a uh, sheer amount of water vapor could be enough to temporarily affect the earth's global average temperature so uh, instead of cooling the surface the reaction could be more warming and that could be one of the factors involved and we could see that hang over into the winter so that plus they have all these i mean this article is pretty extensive with their predictions um but if you look at the overall outlook, which is kind of midway down, <clears throat> they're saying the highlights compared to normal, December through February, uh, rainy, snowy in the northeast, uh, less snow in like the middle DC-ish east coast, um, snower, snowier periods up by like the Michigan area, and then the Pacific Northwest uh, is... is Wetter snow turning cooler, but that looks like the the place where they're gonna they're predicting to have the better snow. Yeah, because one of the the big things about this year too is that this is the triple El Nino. Mm. That you know we kind of talked about it on the last episode a bit, and now as you know we've gone a couple more weeks, things are starting to take shape a little bit more, and you know a lot of the you know the weather experts are starting to chime in about how this, you know, triple El Nino is going to affect things because it's not like it happens all the time. It's, it's a bit of a, a rare phenomenon. And the, um, the climate specialist that's quoted in this article, Paul Pasterlock, he's the AccuWeather senior meteorologist. He says that these third year La Ninas, I say El Nino before I meant La Nina. Sorry. Oh yeah. You said El Nino. I meant La Nina. Uh, it's very tricky. He said with no two La Nina winters being exactly the same, 
the weather setup will be one of the most complicated and dynamic in recent memory due to all of the weather factors in play over the upcoming months. And you mentioned kind of the volcano. That's like a big part of it. And it was early 2022. I think you said 2020. That's it. Oh, it was early 20, January 2022. Yeah, it was this year. Yeah. And it's just, you know, again, we, we you know, we kind of harp on the whole climate change thing and, and you know, so say you threw away your gas powered car and you bought a Tesla, but a volcano erupts and shoots all this ash and plume and carbon dioxide in the air. What difference did your car make? Exactly. Just a question to ask yourself. I'm seeing you in know? Florida now without power. Some people with the electric cars are sitting there with no car because they're like, I couldn't charge it for two weeks. So week and a half. Yeah. Or what's it's been a week now. So. Couldn't charge it for a week, and that car cannot go anywhere because it it doesn't run on partial gas at all. You know, yeah. I was reading about a company that's they're working on batteries that instead of needing lithium, actually are using sodium, hmm. which is pretty cool. So you know, you're using basically salt, or I think I think it was salt or salt water to to power the batteries, which is pretty awesome. Oh wow! You start telling me stuff like that, you get a thousand miles per charge. Now we're speaking my language. We shall see, right. but that's not, we're not experts in any of this stuff. All we care about is skiing right now. So with this triple La Nina, things will get interesting. It does. It is starting to look better for Utah and Colorado because originally things were looking a little bit, not so great. And actually not looking great for the actually, East coast. No, it's, it's not looking that great. Yeah. It's looking like, Utah, Colorado, and northern um, – what state is this? Arizona and, U- and New Mexico. Mm. They're saying it could be 49% of normal and lower. Mm. That's that's the snow outlook October 2020 to April 2023. Uh, then you look got the whole kind of, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts – Vermont kind of has like nothing. So that means they're kind of in the normal. So Vermont. Since 75 to 124, I think it's. Yeah, it's kind of like they're saying normal ish. And then Maine. Maine could be the uh, the gold mine on the East Coast this year because they're saying 125 to 149% of the mm. huge. Also, Montana, Jackson ish in Wyoming, and Idaho and parts of uh, Washington state could be golden. But Tahoe, Mammoth, and you know Colorado and Utah not looking so great right now. Again, these are just models. These are predictions. Things could change. Imagine if you could like reroute a hurricane, like you could just kind of like shoot it on over to Colorado, Utah, like hmm. just just have a, a weather wormhole. Imagine Damn. that. Imagine, imagine that. that tw- imagine those two feet, uh, two feet of rain translated into snow doesn't that translate to like 200 feet of snow or something? something like that right i think it's isn't it like an inch of rain is a foot of snow is that the math i'm looking up right now rain to snow Maybe so 10 feet times feet the amount feet. so one inch of rain is equivalent to 10 inches of snowfall okay 10 to 1 okay so i added an extra zero so if we had two feet of of rain it would be 20 feet of snow damn is 20 feet of snow too much snow, though? That's it's a lot of snow. It might not be enough. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> why would it Why would it not be? Any, it's always not enough. We but wouldn't 20 snow. feet of snow start, like, collapsing buildings? and? Yeah, but you'd, you'd, it would help with global warming. <laughs> there you go. Right? That's true. Just have Weather 50 days warm. of snow. 50 shades of snow. Fifty shades of snow. You got your yellow <laughs> snow, your brown snow, your gray snow. Yeah, so we'll see where this La Nina, triple La Nina goes, but we are going to keep tabs on this as we always do and, and follow the evolution of the jet stream and weather patterns in North America. Nice. And one final story in the ski news. And this is a fun one because this is our pals. 
And these guys have been fans of the podcast uh, for a long time, and they are starting to do their own thing, which is pretty cool. So this is our friends, the Pesky Brothers. They are based out of the Chicago area, and they are hosting with their barbecue company a TGR premiere of Magic Hour. And that's coming up this upcoming weekend, Saturday, October 8th, 530 to 930 Central Time. Course Restaurant, 800 Shermer Road, Glenview, Illinois. Hmm. So you go there, you're getting killer barbecue, you're watching a TGR ski movie. Like, What more do you want? That sounds like a perfect Saturday night to me. It does. <clears throat> so a big shout out. And uh, they've, they've actually sent me some of their rub and their, their barbecue sauce, the vinegar-based sauce. Mm. Delicious. Look at that. Yes. So they've been big fans. A big shout out to them and to the boy band. That's a little inside uh, inside joke. Right. But these guys, when they travel, they uh, they are recognized as a world-renowned boy band. The women, the men, they all flock, follow after them. <laughs> they also make killer barbecue. So thank you so much, guys, for your support. Go check out their hosting, their premiere of Magic Hour this weekend. And that wraps up the ski news for the week. So now onto the main topic. And I've talked about it multiple times already. We had a great talk again with our new buddy, Charles McNall. He is the founder of the Chuck Bucket. He's an engineer by trade. He's a skier by love and by passion. And he decided to combine his passion with his education and uh, occupation to come up with a new product that he felt the market was ready for. He created the Chuck Bucket back in 2020, did a couple iterations of it. They did a Kickstarter, I think, earlier this year. And now they are uh, up and running as a business and taking pre-orders for their next load, which should be ready just as ski season is kicking off. So nice. we think you'll dig this guy. Check it out. Charles McNall, founder of the Chuck Bucket. All right. And we have a very special guest interview this week. It is our new friend, Charles McNall. He is the inventor of the Chuck Bucket. And I could tell you about what it is, but that would not nearly be as good, as involved, and as detailed as what Charles can provide. So, Charles, thank you so much and welcome. Oh, thank you. Glad to be on. So, tell us a little bit about your background and your product, the Chuck Bucket that you created. Sure. So I grew up in uh, upstate New York near Buffalo, grew up skiing as a kid. Holiday um, Valley? Holiday Valley. Oh, uh, wow, baby. Yeah. Buffalo Ski Club, Tamarack, a lot of places that actually have kind of merged together now. Some aren't around anymore. Um, grew up working the coat check at, you know, Kissing Bridge and great times. Um, spent college in upstate New York. Skied a bunch there, Whiteface and Jay Peak and, you know, all the other Northeast resorts. Uh, and then after school, moved out to California, spent six years commuting to Tahoe, four hours each way and hating it. And so about 10 years ago, I moved to Salt Lake City and uh, it's been great ever since. Um, my commute is back down to about a half an hour to go skiing. I'm right at the bottom of the canyon. And uh, so that kind of became, I guess, the inspiration for me to try and make an easier to use ski system. Um, we had basically a really old, ratty, 20-year-old Mercedes SUV. Um, and it was on its last legs. And it was great because I could just throw skis in it whenever I wanted to go skiing. And they had a fold down middle seat. I got a family of four. And so it was awesome because we just throw the skis in the middle. Didn't care if they did soak everything. And, um, and it was awesome until one year when we had Mountain Collective Pass and we just started driving around to all the different resorts. And uh, the back was just constantly going through soaking cycles. Mm. And uh then all of a sudden the fuel pump went out because the water had dripped down over the fuel pump and corroded the electrical connector. Oh, and this was right after we drove back from Mammoth, like across the middle of nowhere, Nevada desert, 
to where we were a hundred miles from the nearest town. And then the next day the fuel pump went out, luckily like 20 miles from home. And so I was like, all right, well, yeah, I can't, I can't do that again. Um, plus then I started looking at, you know, newer cars and I couldn't find any that had fold down middle seats. Um, really? all of them, all, a lot of them moved to two third, one third. The 60, 40 split. Yeah. yeah 60, 40 mm-hmm. split. And my kids, a, my kids would not want to be right next to each other. And then B like even with longer skis and a 60, 40 split, uh, a lot of skis don't fit, you know, a big fat set of powder skis, especially if they're long, they're hitting the next seat. Um, and so I had to start thinking about things. And of course I asked my wife, I was like, all right, well, let's just get a box and that'll be great. We're done. Like, you know, I had a Yakima or a Thule box back in the day and, and she's nope, not doing that. And, uh, no coffin on the roof. Well, yeah, she just, if she wanted to go ski by herself, she couldn't reach it. And then constantly reconfiguring the seats was a huge pain. Um, and so it really came down to, all right, well, what are we going to do? I'm not going to do anything on the roof. Um, she doesn't want that. And they're not going in the car anymore. I didn't really like anything that was out there in terms of like, there's one other hitch mount opportunity. I think Yakima had like an adapter that went on a bike rack as well that I didn't really like. All of them kind of had those, you know, sandwich clamps, which means that it's great if you want to fit two super skinny skis on, you know, one row. But anytime you start getting a variable selection or kid skis and then the poles don't go on there and it wasn't any good. So um, I decided to do the next best thing, which is uh, some straps and a five gallon Home Depot bucket. <laughs> And uh, a cheapest bike rack I could find on Amazon with like just two horizontal prongs um, and just started using that for a season and, you know, be like, all right, you know, it's, it's really jerried, but how, how's it going to work? And it actually started, it was awesome. Like I loved it. Like that five gallon Home Depot bucket and just being able to toss them in uh, was game changing in terms of like, just never having to take more than two minutes to go ski. So, uh, so walk me through that then. So did you have like a trailer, like a, a hitch mount on there? So I had a hitch receiver already, a two inch hitch receiver. We, we had since got a, a newer car. So um, Which probably played into not wanting to put the skis all wet in the nice new car. Exactly. So that was the real thing is like, I got the car working again and then uh, ended up basically, you know, all right, my wife wants a reliable car. We need a reliable car for the family. Let's get a newer car. So we bought something that was off lease um, right at the beginning of the pandemic before uh, all the prices went sky high for used cars. Like, you know, the market was still wondering like, Oh, is everything going to get destroyed? Is no one going to buy cars anymore? And so the prices were still like normal. And so we bought a, a good used car. Um, and had leather seats my wife's you know and i'm just like all right well we're not going to just toss all these wet skis all over you know this and it didn't have middle seat anyways like it would be uh 60 40 um okay so it had a hitch receiver pop this on there it's great i'm loving it um not a big deal to take the bucket off you know and just leave the bike rack on there so again how did you connect then so was it was it wasn't a ball receiver joint was it no, so it was just, uh, you know, that standard L-shaped bike rack with the two prongs that come out? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so you the, use that and you put the bucket in between the prongs? I put the bucket below that, strapped okay. to the, the vertical section. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. And so uh, arms, was that like a brace or did you just... The did arms you braced the upper section of the skis. Okay. And I would basically just strap all the skis to the main post. Um, okay, so the arms were more for the bracing the skis than for the bucket itself. Right, just gotcha. to keep them from going side to side. Right. Yeah. Okay, and so, so I, have a, I have a picture in my head now. What yeah. Like. And you didn't show up on like Jerry the Day or anything like with this setup? Oh, I might have once. I didn't see, <laughs> I don't remember seeing myself, but there was other Jerry of the Day setups that were very similar to what I was rocking. And you know, I didn't care. Like badge of honor, let's be honest. Yeah, if I'm skiing two or three times a week, I 
am just tossing my skis in and going up and then, you know, coming back home and throwing them right back up on the rack or in the corner. And you're and winning skiing two or three I'm, days a week. I'm winning. Exactly. You know? Um, and my commute is easy. Like it's 30 miles up a canyon. I'm in a ski town. So to be fair, like I wasn't going on the interstate for four hours anymore like I used to in California. So I was trying to think, okay, how can I make my life more convenient? And then I found like, oh, this is great. Putting all of these skis in the back of the car. Now I have so much space in the trunk for my boots, for my kids gear, and it's all staying drier. And I was like, okay, this is, this is starting to work. Maybe I'll start working on developing this. So I'm an engineer. That's what I went to school for, you know, pretty hands-on, good at tinkering. And so I just started working through the progression of this of like, okay, how can I make this five gallon Home Depot bucket be a little bit more, I guess, less jerried, less, you know, uh, hacked on there. Um, and I just started iterating. And so um, it's, it's hard when you try and like go from what's the easiest to what actually makes a decent product. So for a while I wanted to keep with a uh, plastic, bucket so i don't know if i even described what the chuck bucket is you know you said i was going to describe this <laughs> so all right to this the listeners nice, out this there nice build up. This is nice yeah build up. Who, who haven't grasped what i've been trying to get at so i i make a we make at you know chuck rack a hitch mount ski rack and it is basically what you see on the back of shuttle buses whenever you go to a ski resort it is a big opening where you throw your poles and skis or board into it and then it shuttles you around the mountain. And it's not on the roof. It's not, you know, in the shuttle bus. And it's a little bit more secure in terms of like, there's an upper ring where you can have your skis secured. And then you can also strap them, which I, we always recommend and we do strap them to the main vertical pole. Um, just so they don't shift around a lot. Uh, you don't have to put them in there. Like in terms of like, you don't have to strap them in. You're not going to lose a ski on the highway. We've tried, believe me, over speed what's, bumps. What's the top speed you tested? I, uh, I won't say I've gone a hundred, but somebody has. Ah, uh, independent testing reviews. Have yeah. Over hundred miles an hour. And the more skis you have in there, the more they're bundled, the less you have any individual one taking a big wind load. Um, you know, we're working on a, a canvas cover to go over the top for people who drive on the highway because that's been a request from a lot of customers uh, just to keep some road grime off. Um, if you're in a canyon, though, and you're going only 35 miles an hour um, to go skiing most of the time, like, or 35 to 50, I don't really see any more grime on them than I ever saw on the roof of my car. Um and to be fair, like it all usually skis off within the first run. <laughs> right. And then when I get home, if you're not drying your edges anyways, well, I don't know what to tell you. Your skis are going to get rusty no matter what. Yeah. If, you're, if you're taking your skis and you're just tossing them on the rack and they're stored with the edges in contact with each other, they're, they're going to get rusted no matter what. Um, so usually like that's what we just recommend to people. If you're like really hardcore... Um, the other thing is, you know, most edges, they're all stainless. Like, they're not meant to rust. Um, and usually all that snow melting off gets rid of a lot of the salt anyways. We're in Utah, unlimited free salt. They salt the roads <laughs> super hard here. And I haven't seen my skis any worse than when I used to have them on the roof, you know, or just toss them in the car. If anything... The worst I ever had my skis was on that long trip to Mammoth and back and going to the different resorts that were far away when they'd sit in the car wet and just fester <laughs> for like a <laughs> few days. In there, right? You know, it was a great product. So basically really liked where it was going with the Chuck Bucket sort of iterative design where, um, you know, I went from a five gallon Home Depot bucket and then I started making uh, my own welded frame and uh, had a ring to hold a trash can, actually, like the little office type trash cans. 
Um, and for a while I wanted to stick with just like a plastic sort of bucket because that way people, people have this interesting perception that putting your skis into a metal bucket will destroy them when they constantly destroy their skis skiing. They're always hitting the edges together while they're sitting on the chair or, you know, um, doing rails or, you know, hitting trees in the woods. There's, people don't realize how hard they are on their gear when they're actually using it. Mm -hmm. And then they expect this like non-moving, very simple transport system to like be a magic baby cradle that doesn't touch them ever. Yeah. While they're driving um, at 80 miles an hour down the highway, swerving. Yeah. So uh, it's one of those things where it's like, if, if you stop and take a minute and actually pay attention to how you're treating your skis, walking across the parking lot, slamming the edges onto the <laughs> asphalt, you know, putting them on the bus floor, like what, it doesn't matter what our racks made of people do the damage to their gear elsewhere. Yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> so, so either way, uh, we, we had that, you know, plastic sort of thing we were going with for a while, but the reality is, is plastics are really bad when you're in a winter environment and you see this a lot. Um, some of our customers had their ski boxes ripped off the roof after a few years, the plastic gets really brittle in the winter, you know, air. Um, and in general, like any, any plastic just getting sitting out there baked was going to just eventually crack. And well, Plus too, with like the water and the salt, I mean, that's not going to be good for the plastic either. Right. And so we started to think, okay, how we should, we're not going to go, you know, with plastic. Because then a customer might have to replace it every five years on a recommended interval, and nobody wants to deal with that. Right. And, and what so, year was the first? Like, well, sorry to interrupt. What was the first year? Like, so oh, you, you had the the original five original gallon. prototype in 2020. Okay. And then I'd say within that year, <clears throat> by the summer, I'd gone through probably three or four prototypes. I went from five gallon bucket to trash cans of various <laughs> sizes. Um, with our own welded frame to, we got away from welds. Um, so the great thing is, is, you know, by being hands-on, I really got to see what manufacturing techniques are actually repeatable so we can ensure quality and welding is the hardest to get, you know, I could weld something great, but then I give it to somebody and it really depends on their skill level. And so, you know, getting rid of welds, moving to more bench sheet metal. Um, so we went from, you know, the plastic bucket to, I think our first buckets after that were stainless and okay. welded stainless. Cause the thought was, okay, stainless isn't going to rust as much and it's super solid. Well, turns out welding that much stainless takes like a half an hour. It is a mm. slow process. And, and you can't speed that up. Can't speed it up. Lots of, lots of, uh, warp, um, inconsistent. It's very thin metal, so it's really easy to blow through it. The welded areas are more likely to rust. Um, and even though then, okay, so if we don't do polished stainless, then we're going to powder coat it. And then what's the point of it being stainless? If it's coated already. Yeah. And then it weighs a ton and then it's going to rust. And so we're like, okay, well, what about aluminum? So then I started making some out of aluminum. Again, aluminum is even harder to weld. Um, and it's brittle um, in terms of like the weld joints are. They're easier to crack. So I had a couple of prototypes that looked great initially. And then by the time you grind the welds down and make it look pretty, um, you know, give it some use, eventually you'll start to see the aluminum welds cracking. Um, and it's just like, okay, well, if this cracks on a customer, that's no good. No. You know, can't, can't have, again, this failing on the highway, like every, every single step in this iterative process is, is okay. How can we give something to somebody that is bomb proof that, you know, isn't going to lose a ski and isn't going to fall off. Um, so that's and, number one know, priority at this point. Number one priority, right? Safety. Yeah. Yeah. Customer yep. satisfaction. So, yeah. And so then we went to uh, riveted aluminum. So just like airplanes are held together, rivets, really hard for somebody assembling to screw up. Like you can do it, but you can see when it doesn't look right. And it's 
it's very prescription based, you know, set the, you know, riveter to this pressure, use this rivet, put it in, make sure they're together and pull. Um, and this is why, you know, airplanes aren't assembled by engineers, they're assembled by hourly workers. Um, and they hold us in the sky just fine. <laughs> Um, that's, that's not a very comforting thought for people who are taking off in a few hours. Oh, airplanes are crazy <laughs> safe. I mean, it is definitely, it's still the safest way to travel. Um, this is true. Yes. But don't yeah. look at the rivets when you get on the plane. No, I mean, look at them. Cool. They're great. Everything's they great. They work. Cause if they're not good, they're either not there or, you know, you can see a huge gap, which you don't see on planes cause they all get inspected. Um, it's the same thing with our buckets. And so, yeah, we went to aluminum. It made it, you know, a third of the weight. And wow. so a big thing for us was, okay, aluminum is great. It's softer than, you know, your ski edges. You're less likely to damage anything. Um, we put a foam pad at the bottom for our customers who are concerned about, you know, their tips. So every check bucket ships with a neoprene pad at the bottom. And then, uh, just durable in general. It's not going to rust. Um, same thing with the upper ring. You know, the upper ring has got, you know, aluminum on it so that, again, you don't have to worry about if your skis scratch it and then they're steel exposed, like not a big deal. Um, and also you're mentioning the foam at the bottom, but there's also holes for drainage. There is holes for drainage, right? Because you don't want to have pooling water regardless. <laughs> uh, is that Was that an issue with the Home Depot bucket or did you actually cut holes in the beginning? So the Home Depot bucket initially didn't have any holes and then I got to drill out and then the same thing for, you know, every version after that, make sure there is drainage holes. It only happened once, right? It, well, no holes. I was lazy for a while and it just dumped the bucket out, but eventually yeah. you just got to do it. Um, but yeah, like with drainage holes, you know, it just drains out because you don't think about it. If you drive home and it's a slushy evening, you'll end up with a quarter inch of water in there. And, uh, and when it falls off from the skis too, if you got it all stuck in the yeah, binding. Exactly. And, yeah. Um, if anything, actually, since your skis are, you know, staying outside, and this is the same for anything on the roof, um, you know, a lot of that snow doesn't really melt because it's cold out. And so, you know, it's actually, as long as you dry it off when you get home, your edges are usually be a little bit better off because it wasn't sitting there wet for a while. It was all frozen until you wipe them off. It's like Han Solo. Yeah. Frozen in carbonite. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that lightweight kind of became a theme for us. You know, we kind of, I have a bad back. Um, so at not wanting to lift more than 30 pounds at any given time kind of became key. And so we started taking that into account in our design. So the bucket pops on and off, you know, and it's a lightweight, you know, uh, I guess bucket. <laughs> Do you have an actual weight for the the whole system? The whole system weighs, oh, I want to say, around forty three pounds. Like when okay. we ship them, they're forty three, so I think it's about thirty seven. And then most of that's in the hitch because the hitch post itself is about twenty five pounds, and it's it's all steel. Um, it's bolted together steel with grade eight hardware, and you know, it's, it's meant to be super robust. Um, and we did that basically also because, you know, now we're selling a bike rack. And so we didn't want to have a platform where people would later on have to upgrade because, oh, you're getting the bike rack. You have to buy the more beefy one now. Start off with a really solid structure. And then you can have a bunch of different modular accessories on there. Oh, so the base pole that you have for the chuck bucket is also the base pole for the bike rack? Yes, exactly. Oh, that's very cool. So when you're in the shoulder season, which there's a lot of out here, uh, it was a big pain for me to, I used to have a nice one-up rack, uh, one-up USA, you know that. Oh, those are super nice. Aluminum yeah. ones, super nice. Mm -hmm. Loved it. It's a great rack. But I would destroy my back every single spring and fall, pulling that thing on and off <laughs> to not have it in the winter on the car. And... And there's like no way to get around it being less than 50 something pounds. Like even if you take off the two extra bike, you know, adapters on it to where it's just a single two bike rack, mm -hmm. it was still 50 something pounds and awkward to lift. And so, oh, wow. um, 
the ski rack attachment, the bike rack attachment, all those pop on and off. They're less than 30 pounds for any given part. And so in the shoulder season, it takes two minutes or less. I mean, you pop two pins to put the bike rack on or you pop two pins off to put the ski rack on and you can swap between them. And I, you know, I do it all the time, basically where I'll go ski in the morning. And then when the one, the sun comes out and it warms up in the afternoon, bike racks on and I go out with the kids and, you know, go bike around in the Valley. That's perfect. So you can just, so basically you can use the rack all year. Is what you're saying. Right. Exactly. The base, the base always stays on. It's just a matter of which attachment you're going to have based on what the, uh, what the season is. Exactly. And the nice thing about the base is it strips down to just a single pole. That's really easy to tilt out of the way. And so it's unobtrusive and you're not, you know, the nice thing about, or I guess the, the worst part about my old bike rack was always tilting it out of the way when I go like grocery shopping or my wife would be doing something. And you see that now with those big vertical bike racks that are so big that you never remove them. I highly doubt people enjoy having that constantly in the way of their trunk. <laughs> and parking too. Like parking is a lot yeah. worse. There's, there's, you're adding a huge variable to, to driving now. Cause I don't know if, if other cars with their, um, you know, the sensors in the front, when they, like the emergency braking sensors, do they notice there's a rack that's sticking out two feet from the car? Or is the, is the sensor focusing on the bumper or the windshield of the car in front? So you're adding lots of other variables for problems when you have those big racks in the back. That's for sure. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's where the company is at right now. We um, launched our chuck bucket last, I guess, this, this spring and had a great Kickstarter success. We delivered uh, all of those units. We're almost sold out. I think we've got, you know, a dozen or so units left. And then our next round is already it's incoming. We'll have them probably early November just in time to get them out to everybody for the ski season. Perfect timing. Yep. And, and uh, uh, so one yeah. question, one quick question about, so the uh, so st riveted stamped aluminum, is that what it is? It's so the bucket is bent aluminum, bent sheet metal. Okay. And riveted together and then powder coated. Okay. And then and the rest of it locally, or is that overseas? We do that overseas. So, okay. We made all the prototypes locally. If you want a custom color, for example, we'll make that locally because then we just have our powder coater match the color of your car or whatever you want. Um, but all the rest are made overseas. And that's just honestly the only way to bring it to market. Um, yeah, I just, I think, again, I've, I'm just fascinated by the process. Uh, I, I, how did you even like, how do you go about finding a producer to make this for you? So we, well, Alibaba. <laughs> so we had, <laughs> prior to this company, I had a bike trainer um, that I tried to sell for a number of years. Um, it was a, a crown bike roller that you put your bike on and it would, you know, be like a treadmill. And okay. so I had made that overseas with a man in Salt Lake who had an interest in a factory in China. And okay. so that kind of was my first foray into that. Uh, the company itself was not successful. Um, and so that got shut down last year, but that kind of got me into, okay, this is how manufacturing in Asia works. Um, and it's people complain about the not made in the U S mentality, but by me buying it from this guy in Salt Lake, I'm providing him a living in the U S he's providing like seven families in Asia with a living. And so I don't feel bad in this global economy about basically <laughs> feeding seven families instead of just one. Yeah. Um, and so that was the, the same thing here is plus I couldn't even make it if I made it anywhere else. So for the check bucket, for example, prototypes cost $700 to make. Um, you have a typical markup of Forex for any product that you sell. If, and so nobody's going to spend that much money on a chuck bucket here. Um, yeah, that's, that's the tricky part. People say they want everything made here. It's like, right. well, do you want to spend, like you said, four X $1,600 no, yeah. for a chuck bucket? Yeah. So nobody, nobody's going to spend that. And so 
um, even making it overseas, our margins are not great compared to what you'd see because our volumes are low and we can't start off with 10,000 unit volumes. Um, there's <laughs> just, nobody knows we exist. We don't have a massive marketing budget like any of the major rack companies. Um, and nobody really realizes that all those major rack companies, they're making all the racks in Lithuania, basically the China of Eastern Europe. <laughs> um, so, and I looked at making stuff there as well. Like it's, it's not really any different. Uh, Made in the U.S. is great. And I make we make some parts in the U.S. So our one and a quarter hitch rack adapter, those are made in the U.S. in my shop because I can get thicker material in the U.S. that is the right, you know, English sizing. And so I cut and drill and get them powder coated, you know, in Utah. And then those are the way it gets shipped to our customer. Okay. You know, where, where we can get the margins on the products, um, we will make them in the U.S., but some things we just can't yet. And if we get the volumes up to where we can, I'd love to just run a shop here and be making stuff. But until then, I mean, it's just not sustainable at the price points that people are willing to pay. And I would rather have happy customers where I'm meeting their, you know, market need, you know, providing a solution for them. Uh, and if I got to lose some customers, that are unhappy with where it's manufactured, that's fine. It's part of the game. Yeah. No, that makes yep. perfect sense. I mean, from a business standpoint, I mean, again, you're not going to kill yourself, spend all this time creating a company just to lose money. Right. I've already lost money on a previous company. So, <laughs> uh, I need to not do that this time around. <laughs> well, so far, so good, right? Things are looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, so now, so this, does this mount up to a two inch or a one and a quarter? So this mounts up to a two inch standard and we recommend everybody like there is no reason why you shouldn't have a two inch hitch. It just provides you so many more options for the rest of the market for anything you want to buy. Yeah. I don't get, I, I when I got, I have a Subaru Outback and when I got it, I wanted a trailer hitch and they defaulted to a one and a quarter. And I yep. just, I like, is it just that, it's I don't think they'll factory even install a two inch. You have to do aftermarket. And that was the same issue with my sister. She had a brand new Subaru and asked them to install the hitch and they gave her a one and a quarter. And I just think that's ridiculous. My leaf has a two inch hitch that I put on. Yeah. Like I know it, the Outback has some funky exhaust piping. Cause I have the, uh, the 3.6, mm -hmm. six, six cylinder, not to brag. Uh, but yeah, there's like, I guess the way the mufflers are set up on that, you have to take them all off just to get the hitch installed. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. So it's a bit of a, so, so now, I mean, I could install a two inch, but I'm just like, eh, I'll get an adapter and hope for the best. Well, and that's kind of why we have the one and a quarter. It's not our default. We make it as a convenience for people like you who just got stuck with <laughs> a one and a quarter. And so the nice thing is, is it will replace the two inch stud. It is not an adapter. And so you don't have the added extension. You don't have the added, you know, wobble that you get. You don't That's have nice. to, you don't have to take your one and a quarter and adapt it to a two inch. It is an actual replacement. And so that, that's kind of like our trade off for our customers in terms of like, Hey, we want you to have the best experience we can provide with a one and a quarter, but you still have a one and a quarter. So for example, we downrate the total weight limit to 150 pounds. Um, the rack itself, the chuck bucket, is only rated for 100 pounds. So you shouldn't be that high anyways. But our bike <laughs> rack is rated for 275. And so if you go to a one and a quarter with our bike rack, you're still only allowed to put 150 on that. Ooh, yeah. That's gets so, a little tricky with multiple. Three, yeah, four, four, four bikes. bikes, you can probably do it. You're not going to hold two 80-pound e-bikes on there, though, at least mm. not to <laughs> what we recommend. Um, it's on you after that point, you know, we, we, yeah, I mean, we provide our recommendations and then we can't control what customers do. Um, same luckily, with Tide pods, right? Tide yeah. made pods for the dish for the washing machine and people start eating them. Hey, that's on. Yeah, you. exactly. Um, now they, they could be at fault cause they made them look delicious. That's, <laughs> that's on them. <laughs> I mean, that purple and green, I mean, how yeah. do you, how do you not say, how do you not, how do you say no to that? I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it'll hold 100 pounds in the spring. I always load it up with two by fours for whatever project I'm doing at Home Depot. 
which is super nice not having to like break my windshield in my car trying to throw them inside oh dude yeah i've had those i've my whole interior is scraped up from buying uh uh what, what did we buy i think it was shiplap and i put oh, all my yeah. seats down put all my seats down and of course like the the leather the back of the seat the back seat and the back of the front seat which had to get pushed forward or pushed pushed back so it could lay flat got all scratched up because of it so i could see where this and this actually marketing advertising Drive to Home Depot every day, load that thing up in front of you're right in front of where the entrance is. And people are like, hey, what is that device you're putting all of your two by fours into? And they're like, well, kind sir, allow me to introduce the chuck bucket to you. Exactly. Perfect yeah, advertising. I, like hauling Have you PVC. had people ask questions? Oh, yeah. Occasionally people ask questions. I mean, the problem is going there and constantly buying things. You do you you get into a, a habit of doing that. Next thing you know, your house broke. So True. you go buy and then return and buy and return. That's right. Well, go. for a while, I mean, even right now I have, you know, beat up skis. I just leave permanently back there, but uh, yeah, you can golf bags, all sorts of things. The other day I had to take 10, is it 10 gallons? Yeah. 10 gallons of oil to go get recycled, you know, engine oil from changing the oil out all right. for a couple of years. And it's I was like, oh. whatever. I don't want this in my car. It's going to get everyone. I was like, wait, I got a truck bucket. Like, so I threw it in the back of the bucket and filled the whole thing up with containers of oil and brought it to pet boys. And was like, here you go. And by the, you know, by the time I got back home, that bottom was just like soaking with oil, but easy to clean and not in my car, which was super awesome. Yes. So you basically keep finding new ways to use the chuck bucket. Yep. If it's a propane tank, so you don't have to have a live propane tank in your car. Oh, look at that. Yeah. I, I like on the website too, the tree. Now that it's almost, we're getting towards the holiday season. Could you fit a Christmas tree in the chuck bucket? Well, we can and have. It look is. That. I mean, it, it's totally fine, you know, strapped in on the back of it. it you kind of get to scrape your hands up, you know, to strap it in there, but. But if you have like the netting, if they give like the netting. Oh, yeah. Tree, if it's netted, I forget. I forget they do that. I was thinking of like you cut it down in the woods yourself. But yeah. Like a real goddamn man. Yeah, I'm talking I, about like Jersey getting your tree at a tree farm. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're, uh, you know, getting your tree at the tree farm from the local grocery store or whatever, then, <laughs> uh, and it's netted, totally be like super easy to just pop it in there and then go home. I mean, there, it's a million advertising. uses. And then they're advertising. You know, we, we try and ask on Instagram for people to post what they put in it. Oh, that's um, cool. And so eventually we'll start seeing more and more things in there. Don't put your kids in it and drive anywhere just because they fit. Listen, you can only, you can't nerf the world. No, but <laughs> it's I not mean, recommended at all. I think I need to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, it's one of those things where it's whatever will fit put it in there as long as it's less than a hundred pounds. Um, and it'll hold more than that. You know, it's a factor of safety thing. Does a keg fit in there? Corny kegs do. I don't know about a full size kegs. Those are hard to get. They're not in Utah. Oh, that's true. You guys have those funky. Yeah. Laws still They're, the laws are getting better. Um, but getting regular kegs requires going out of state. So I, I don't know about that. Plus, you don't want to drive with that in public view if you go out of state and get a full-size keg and then you're going <laughs> home. True. Kind of advertising your, uh, your violating of right. ATF laws, I guess. <laughs> these, are, these are important questions, though. I'm just, I'm just asking what people want to know. Yeah. Um, in terms of capacity, I mean, I know for sure four snowboards, maybe five. I haven't really tried. I'm, I don't own any more than one snowboard. You know, every, everything else is skis. Um, but we've definitely put four in it for, you know, four people going out. And then uh, skis, I mean, depending on size, you know, I think we've had up to eight pairs in there with maybe six sets of poles. Um, it's really whatever fits. Uh, it's hard to tell people exactly what will fit because everybody's skis and snowboards and everything are different widths and, you know, bindings are all incredibly different. Um, but it fits as much as it fits. And unless you're in a conversion van, usually it'll fit an entire car load. Nice. Yeah. It's only bound by your uh, imagination, right? Right. And, um, you were, and so when you have them in there, you were saying too, that you, uh, it's best that you strap, is it everything together 
you strap it to the upright pole? Yeah. So typically um, we'll recommend like Vole ski straps, something long like that. We actually have custom 48 inch long ski straps that will be coming in for this season. So that'll be longer than anything else on the market that can actually be used as a belt. <laughs> if you want to have a ski strap belt. Um, <laughs> ah, that's pretty cool. We sell currently 52 inch straps that are two volet straps strapped to, uh, they're welded together. Um, so those are custom made by us and those are super awesome. Um, in terms of like, if you have a full bucket full of gear, you can have one long strap and instead of taking two 32 inch straps and putting them together. And, uh, so we definitely recommend, you know, whatever you put in there, if you strap it to the main pole or at least together, it will keep it from shifting around like four sets of skis in there strapped together to the main post tight. They're not moving. They don't shift around. They move probably less they do in a box because they're not constrained at all in a box. They're, you know, hitting one side or the other as you're going around corners. Um, cars typically, when they're riding on roads, they're vibrating up and down, right? Mm -hmm. And so your gear is constantly in a box vibrating against each other up and down with all the road vibration versus in this situation, usually it's the tails sitting on that foam pad not really moving much at all. Um, you don't feel yourself vibrating left and right in a car. <laughs> yeah. And so it's really, you know, in terms of like wear and tear on your skis rattling together, it's super minimal. Um, I'd say compared to a box or compared to sitting inside your car itself. And you were saying you guys are working on a cover now right. as well. Yeah. So we're going to make a super simple canvas cover that just, slips onto the top like a big sock and then <laughs> straps through the uh, strap holes on the bucket. And it'll have some extra canvas to telescope inside the bucket. So if you have long skis or short skis, you know, they'll be covered. Um, and the bottom will just be open. Because if you just want a fully enclosed bag, buy a ski or snowboard bag. Which put you could just put in, in the chuck bucket too. Yeah, like yeah. just throw it in there. I mean, just like as if you're taking someone to the airport, you know, it's no different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we tell a lot of people with have like ski racers in their family, like, Oh, you know, if you're concerned, which racers are, you know, they're super concerned about everything, bases, <laughs> edges, whatever. Yeah. Put them in a book, put them in a bag and they'll be fine. You know, yeah, they're not going to come out. They're not going to get banged up. They're going to be, you know, at the resort when you get there and you just pull them out of the bag there. Um, but yeah, ours will be open. So that way, when you put your skis in there wet, it can drain out the bottom on the ride. So yeah, canvas in the morning, convertible top down and then at night. So it all dries yeah. out. Or all I'll out. say, I'm not going to use the bag unless I go, you know, 70 miles on the highway to, a, you know, a faraway place. Um, but a lot of people want it, especially like if you're living in the Bay Area and you're driving all that distance to Tahoe, yeah, you know the the canvas cover is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, again I'm thinking selfishly because I'd have to drive usually a couple hours to get to our favorite places and yeah, highway driving 80 miles an hour, winter crap, lots of salt rocks. Um, yeah, the cover just uh, that 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 clinches clinches the deal because you mentioned the the box on top. I have a I won't say the brand, they're not a sponsor. I have a box on top and I've wrapped like two pair like two towels around each pair of skis it just looks ridiculous it takes forever like you said you can't one like i'm relatively good shape i can get my box on by myself but that's not normal like most people need someone to help them what drove me crazy when we first bought this car um it's you know the t brand i had to get like the special the footings for the for the rack for the um the cross or the why can't I think of the word for the, the bars on top? Every car has like a specific footing you have to get. Like you can't just get like a generic footing. And it just works. Right. Like that blew my mind. Cause I called the dealership. I'm like, Hey, do you guys have this? They're like, no, they're too specific. You have to get it from like the company or Amazon or something. And I needed them in like two days. So I kind of panicked. I like, 
how to get like express shipping just to get it there so I could actually get those on there so I can put the crossbars on so I could put the, the coffin on top. And again, the ordeal, the number of parts, because it's not just buying the box because the boxes are expensive to start with. You still have to buy it, usually at least two other pieces to it, the footings. And then most cars don't have the crossbar. Some do. But if you need like a heavy duty crossbar, that's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks as well. So you're in it for probably 1200, 1500 bucks. If you're getting like a, a good box and crossbars. Right. And then in the summer when it hits, do you want that on your car all the time? Now you got to pull it on and off. Yeah. Where, you, where are you storing it? You know, they're not small. I had a Honda Accord for a while and had a box on top. And again, same thing. You got to find the feet, get the box on there. And then you got all this big whistling air mass that's pulling your, you know, probably losing five miles a gallon on the highway. And when gas was a dollar 50, you're like, and eh, no big deal. But when gas is five bucks, right. You know, you're like, I'm taking this stupid thing off. I'll throw it in the backyard if I have to. Yeah. So a lot of our, like, uh, you know, like my leaf, which was utterly useless to go skiing with until I got the check bucket on there. Um, you know, now it's great because I don't have to worry about electric range when uh, there's nothing on the roof, right? Most of the time. And then same thing for Teslas. Like you have this nice Tesla, it gets 300 miles. You put a box on top and you're getting like 250. Um, the X's can't even put something on the top, right? Because they have those gull wing doors. That was a question I had for James too when he first reached out to me. And I, I made it sound like it's funny because I asked him the question and it made it seem like I had a Tesla X. Like, oh yes, what should I put? Because you look at the website and like you mentioned, those Falcon doors, they kind of fold up like that and you can't, there's no capabilities of putting a box on there. And Tesla sells their own specific ski and snowboard rack. But I mean, it doesn't look like it's, I mean, it maybe holds what, two snowboards? Uh, it says they hold up to six pair of skis, but it doesn't look terribly capable, flexible, expandable, and you're stuck with the Tesla one. Right. Um, where something like this, you know, again, you don't have to buy uh, multiple iterations of it. You can you can buy this one chuck bucket, put everything you need in there, no adapters, no attachments, just get all your stuff in there. And with this, you got to buy a whole other bike rack separate. Well, with yours... You have your your base system ready, and then you can get the adapter for the bikes. Yep, I love that. And we're gonna try and, yeah, I mean, we're trying to have more and more accessories for basically people like you know, like myself, like a lot of people who like the rack that they got a family or they're active and they constantly are switching what they're doing. Um, one thing that I'm really excited to work on is a uh, solar shower attachment basically like a super easy to pop on shower curtain. And it's, it's not so much for like showering when you're camping, but more like if you go to the beach and you want to just like change your kids, it's a huge pain because they don't want anyone to see them. So they want to get changed in your car and then everything gets super sandy and nasty. And it'd just be so nice to just have like a super simple curtain or something to have them just pop into and get changed. Or even as an adult, like, pop in there it's like you don't want to tick it as an adult yeah exactly end up on some list (laughs) my son is not that kid though he just strip pulls his bathing suit down and like you know teenage girls walk by he's like sup he's fine (laughs) oh good for him that's good confidence (laughs) it's uh it's a little too much confidence (laughs) yeah so and then the other thing for the bucket like you're saying in terms of like you know a lot of people ask for dividers in the bucket and maybe we'll make some but the reality is as soon as we start fitting it to any single solution, it's less utilitarian for everybody else. So like for right now, it's like, yeah, we're just, it's a big open container and it'll fit everything from skinny skis to big skis. Cause like if you have a bunch of tubes that are all one size and you put one single skinny ski in one tube and you have one really fat pairs of skis that barely fits in it and you can't fit poles in that other tube, like now all of a sudden it's not as useful. Yeah. And look, so, at, look at gondolas that were built like, you know, 15 years ago or so. Where yeah, they don't fit they anything. Don't fit that ski anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're kind of future proofing it by doing less. Exactly. And like I said, we'll, we'll continue to, you know, iterate on it. We'll probably make an XL version that gives an extra six inches or something for people that need a little bit more space. But would you go you know, wider or deeper with that? Wider, 
probably. Um, as soon as you go deeper, you get more leverage, sticks out further. Are there any laws too regarding how like deep uh, something attached to the hitch can be? Yeah, you need reflectors and things like that if you go past a certain depth. Uh, there's different states have different license plate laws. So for example, we have license plate mounting holes on the back of the bucket. Oh, wow. So if you need to mount a license plate, you can. Um, depends on your state. Uh, it doesn't block any lights, so that's not really so much an issue. Maybe maybe some state has a light law for your license plate. I don't know. Um, Europe has all sorts of regulations, so we don't cater too much to Europe per se. They have requirements for like full battery attests for anything mounted to your hitch, for example. Really? Um, through European certifying bodies. And so like if you buy anything from, I guess, Thule, they probably have to do that. Anybody who sells in Europe um, has to usually go through all of that. Um, but in the U.S., it's kind of like the Wild West. I mean, we do our job in terms of making sure it's engineered well. You know, we do load testing, we do analysis, and then just clever enough design to ensure like, okay, what if a bolt breaks? Is it going to fall apart on the road or is it going to still be held there with gravity? You know, things like that. Um, so that's really <laughs> one of, uh, I'll, I'll get into two of the biggest Facebook comments we get, you know, from <laughs> haters. One is, uh, oh, this thing's held together with pins. It's going to fall apart. Uh, well, that's not true. It's held together with gravity. And the pins are there for safety. And if you look at most anything hitch related, there's a single hitch pin going in your hitch. Like the pin isn't designed to hold the load. The pin is designed to ensure that things don't move around. Um, so that's that's the first one. And the second one, which I thought is always funny, is people are like, oh, I don't, I'm not going to put my skis on the back of you know my car where they could get rear-ended. Well, that's the argument for a bike rack. People put their... $5,000 bikes, four of them on the back of their car. And they don't have the same concerns about, you know, getting rear ended. I think that's a silly argument as well. Yeah. That's just Facebook people being Facebook. Yeah. People. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, we also are going to be selling uh, hitch locks, locks for the pins. So if you want to lock everything on there, you can. Um, it fits, you know, standard, long u-bolt master locks if you want to use those as well honestly if you want it fixed in place you can just bolt it replace that pin with a bolt and then with that are you talking about locking the actual whole bucket or, or locking the individual like your your bound up group of skis uh the individual buck like the accessories themselves okay. for the skis i mean it's actually super easy to lock them up with uh we really like the master lock Python. It's just like a cable lock that mm -hmm. cinches tight too. So you can actually use it as a uh, strap for the main support pole if you want also, but you can feed that thing through every single break, every single snowboard binding on, you know, your rack and yeah, somebody can come and cut your lock, but then they really want that stuff. Anyways, they're going to get it no matter what. Yeah. That's that, I mean, how, I mean, settle that. how good are your skis that people are going to, you know, Still how good are your skis? How good are your bikes? I mean, everybody's different. Um, I'll lock my skis up that, you know, if I'm going into a restaurant for a couple hours. Yeah. Yeah. And I sure hope nobody's walking around with a bolt cutter in the winter looking for, you know, ski racks. <laughs> um, it's a matter of, you know, stopping the theft of convenience to where it's just sitting there open. Right. Because wasn't there a story? Was it last winter at uh, Snowbird? where like dozens of pairs of skis were stolen and they, they recovered them. Some kid just every weekend was like taking a couple pairs. Oh, really? I'm not surprised. I mean, I had my snowboard stolen when I was uh, growing up in the Northeast. I mean, it was a weekly occurrence. Somebody would go, they would grab 12 pairs of skis at a time with two people. And then they would just, you know, immediately drive up to Canada and then sell them. And it was a common occurrence. And so like, if you didn't lock your skis up on the rack, like it was on you and I didn't lock my snowboard up and it was only a matter of two seasons before it was gone. Bunch of savages in the Northeast. <laughs> yeah. I think luckily I think it's, there's less of that now just with the prevalence of cheap cameras and 
honestly, there's a lot more people skiing out there so that they're, they're not worth as much. Yeah. It was only $15,000 worth of skis. It was last <laughs> May. They, uh, they recovered them. One kid, 15 pairs. Yeah. Yeah. Just over weeks. Just was ta- we're taking them. Guy was wearing the exact same outfit every time though. And they started putting it together, seeing the skis disappearing from the racks and seeing this guy in the exact same, Ugh. uh, you know, same outfit and tied them together and got them. Well, good, good for them for catching them. Cause a lot of times, you know, you always feel like the authorities just don't care one bit. <sighs> sure. Seems that way. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you got insurance. You're fine. <laughs> it's just like, what? You're rich enough to ski. Just go buy another pair. Yeah. Yeah. So this is such a cool product. Um, so y- you have some new stuff coming out. Where can people get more information? And if they want to buy one, where do they go? Right. So you can go to the chuckbucket.com and, you know, we have inventory currently for the Chuck Bucket and then pre-orders for our bike racker on there as well. Um, also, you know, chuckrack.com is our other, you know, sister site. They all kind of go to the same place to our Shopify page. But that's where you can learn more about it. And then definitely if anyone wants, they can reach out to us and uh, shoot us an email through the contact page on that. And we'll be super glad to answer any questions they have about, you know, will it fit this? You know, how will it help with, you know, this other thing? And we like hearing about other accessories too. If people have ideas for accessories, like, great, tell us. We are wonderfully small and totally willing to work on new products for people that have a specific need, you know, like uh, whitewater kayaks, short whitewater kayaks is something that people are always asking us about. So that's on our chopping block of things to start looking at. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And your website too. I mean, there is tons of information on here and I love how you, you really have all the specifics in terms of the, the weight, the sizing, the, what a uh, trailer hitch it attaches to. And then even the, the video showing the tilting of it, all the different things that fit in there. I mean, you guys really, you can tell are super passionate about this and went through a lot to, you know, show people what is capable with this rack. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, basically every time someone has a question that's not on there, we try and add it in there, make it so that, you know, everybody can find the info they're looking for. Super cool. So the chuckbucket.com, chuckrack.com. Charles, anything else you want to add? Uh, sorry to talk so much. It was awesome being on the show with you. I mean, super no, excited. No, I apologize. This was uh, this was really informative and it was a fun conversation. I love hearing people's origin stories. I think it's I think it's so cool just hearing how people got to from point A to point B. Yeah, I I think that you know there was definitely a market need, and I'm really glad to kind of bring something to market that a lot of the larger you know, rack manufacturers kind of just haven't been providing. So, you know, if Chuck Rack can do that. They're the the big guys. They, if it it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. They've been making the same ones for 20, 30 years. Why change? Why innovate? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Charles, thank you so much. Chuckbucket.com. Go check it out. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want more information, we'll have links in the show notes at skibumpodcast.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We do appreciate it. Check us out, skibumpodcast.com. Go to the socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Untap, YouTube, at skibumpodcast. Send us an email, skibumpodcast at gmail.com. Get ready for us at Snowbound. We'll be there. Wow. Boston, November 18th through the 20th, Heinz Convention Center, Boston, Mass., Thank you to Chuck Bucket. Check them out, chuckbucket.com. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Stay healthy, stay fluting. See ya.